Welcome to another episode of the Collab Talk podcast, where we discuss the convergence of technology, business productivity, and collaboration culture. My guest is a returning guest here is Alex Doyle, Vice President of Product Management with Verizon Business Group. Welcome, Alex. Thank you, Christian. It's great to be here again with you. Again, yes. In your first appearance uh, on the podcast last summer, we talked about the expansion of unified communication solutions within the collaboration space and specifically, you know, my background in the Microsoft ecosystem, SharePoint teams, all that, but specifically about Verizon's partnership with Microsoft. So the, it was the, uh, the Verizon mobile for Microsoft teams, VMMT and that integration with teams. So that was a great conversation. That was episode 78. For those that are interested, you can go back. Of course, I'll have a link here in the blog post. Um, of course, you can also search for Alex Doyle and Collab Talk Podcast, and you'll find it across wherever you listen to your podcasts. It's on Spotify and iHeart and Apple and Stitcher and kind of everywhere else. So all the major platforms. But we're talking today, broader discussion here. We're going to tap into your knowledge, your the the, the history, the gray hairs that we gray both hair. have, uh, talking about the evolution of unified communications and the future of the UC space. Now, this is something, I mean, it's, it's, it, it's amazing. In the 33 years I've been in tech, and of course I started early in my career, if you recall, I was with uh, good old Pacific Bell. And then I went to about a year after the launch of what was um, Pacific Bell Mobile, what was it? Uh, um, it, 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 was, it changed to Pac Bell Mobile. Yeah. Um, but it was, uh, they, they went through a couple name changes, then became singular, if you remember, singular wireless. I so I indeed. joined about a year, year and a half after the formation of Pac Bell's mobile business and worked on some huge projects. And from that time in the mid 90s to now, I mean, it's pretty dramatic, the changes that have happened in the space. So maybe we start here. Maybe you could just describe you know, the initial vision and the driving driving factors behind the emergence of unified communications in the 80s and the 90s. I'd say here's my favorite story about this topic or an anecdote or a fable, if you will. I think, you know, I started my telecom back in the early 90s too. Like you said, I've seen an enormous amount of change. Here's the story I always go back to. I was talking to a customer uh, at a trade show. I think it was Enterprise Connect. And they said, way back in the day, if you were going to an enterprise, there'd be the telecom person and there'd be the datacom person. And the telecoms person's job was always to just kind of remove costs and drive out costs. And the datacoms person's job was to drive kind of productivity and strategy. Mm -hmm. And then you go fast forward five or 10 or eight years and that telecoms person job is still low level or maybe gone. And that datacom person's job, now they're now the CIO, right? Now they're, they're running strategy or something. And I like that story because I think that's what unified communications is all about. Back a generation or two ago, you just wanted to have a phone system and you wanted to have it cheap and you wanted to have it reliable. And the whole premise of unified communications, I think, was all about productivity, right? Mm -hmm. How can it be more strategic to the business? How can we make our sellers more productive, our, our engineers go faster, make decisions faster, serve customers faster? There's a lot of technology waves that happened, but I think that original goal of unified communications, your premise, was all about stop talking about like low cost and start talking about productivity. You know, it's interesting, though, what I, this is my observation of, of the space, too, is that, uh, you know, because it was once you saw the, the launch of the rise of smartphones and the, the prevalence of, of high speed Internet. And of course, I went I left the phone company and I went to a DSL company, if anybody remembers North Point Communications. And there was the what rhythms, uh, COVAD, not COVID, yeah. COVAD and North Point uh, that were the three rivals in that space. 
and we were at North Point, we were based in, in San Francisco, um, is that it, what you saw more and more people getting, uh, you know, high speed internet, you know, the, the, the nature of the, the solutions was evolving and changing. The people that were in those telephony roles that, you know, some of them lost their jobs or, or they merged into other kind of networking spaces. They kind of found each other in these vendors that became highly specialized in unified comms. And there were in the Microsoft ecosystem, this is especially true, very high priced consultants. Like they found they, like that niche. I think organizations realized that and we, we got rid of this, this knowledge. We got rid of these, these people and then how essential it was to have people that understood the telephony capabilities, as well as the, the software, the networking, the, the other SaaS based services. I think that's exactly right, Christian. And you touched on another point too, is like, I remember back in those days when you had COVAD and all those other companies, if I go back and again, I'm dating myself to that telecommunications act of 1996, it, it really generated a ton of new entrants into the space, which then stimulated a lot of innovation, right? Back at the time I was on a vendor that was building unified communication solutions and you weren't trying to just engage with like, you know, two big PBX vendors and three big telecom vendors. You had all these alternative service providers out there, whether they were DSL providers or application service providers or whatnot. And I really do think in hindsight, that did kind of drive the industry forward. You know, the DSL providers would say, hey, what SaaS things can I put on top of it? Like you said, Microsoft yeah. got into the game. You know, we, we did see a lot of interesting innovation from those days, which I think continued to evolve to this day. Right. Well, and, and a lot of that, too, uh, part of what we're uh, we're talking about, because I was involved with that, where you had like a mom and pop cellular phone store that suddenly, because of that act in the late 90s, was able to to re to purchase uh, airtime and resell that. And so the vendors were you know, the, the phone companies uh, were forced to um, to resell that. And it, so that, that you're right. It, it really sparked innovation. It helped. It's one of those things that the market does is it, it then drove down a lot of the costs. You know, I don't remember what my, I remember my phone bill being so high, so high in those yeah. early days of, of, of mobile phones. Um, but now then all of these different options, these little stores that just, that popped up. So a lot of that capability you had number portability came out of that time. And that's something we take for granted now is that you go and like, I, I, I grew up with a 415, I grew up in the San Francisco Bay area over in the East Bay, grew up with a 415 area code. Well, now that's just in the peninsula. It's just San Francisco. And there's been a couple different area code splits, you know, away from that. But with the number portability, if you have a, a cell phone number, like you can keep it, you can move yeah. anywhere. I, I'm living in Utah now. My cell phone number is the Seattle area. Yeah, yeah, that's a valuable cell phone number. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I think that's a good point. And it kind of also reflects that the innovation is not just on the technology. A lot of it's kind of business model and new bundles and new ways to serve customers. You know, I think with Unified Communications, for example, I'll give you an analogy of like the consumer cell phone market today. Now, a lot of service providers will say, Hey, let's uh, let's bundle in, you know, Netflix or Hulu or Max or put those into your mobile plan. I I think unified communications has been the B two B angle of that, right? You know, fifteen years ago, the cable companies made a big play into doing broadband into a small business, but also bundling in your voice, your messaging, maybe uh, you know, an Office three sixty five subscription, and really being able to build that whole kind of business in a box solution as well. And I like that because it's 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 business model innovation just as much as product innovation. You're putting the unified communications into maybe an easier to acquire offer. Well, that really started, uh, I think where I, I started really paying close attention was just before 9-11, uh, uh, bringing up some big things here, COVID and 9-11. Uh, only because I was in Japan when all of that happened. I was actually the end of my work day watching the news and was watching it all happen at the end of my day in Tokyo. Um, but I was calling people. I think it was the early version of Yahoo Messenger that was one of the first to have 
a telephony, it was from digital to landline. And there, I think there were a couple others that were out there, but that just, I mean, for me to be able to do that, you know, very quickly on a, a, a dial up hotel connection, you know, get through and reach out to people where phone lines were struggling to connect through, mm-hmm. um, you know, everybody was calling everybody. Um, but I, that's, I started to see that, that shift and just thinking differently about those tools. Like I could actually see, uh, I don't, I think it was a couple years later where we saw like the first CRM integration into a telephony offering with a headset connected to your laptop. That's exactly right. And I think those general themes of um, making communications more accessible, bundling more things into the offer, integrating things, all all those stay, all those are durable and permanent. I think what ends up shifting sometimes now is more as like technology underneath, just like, um, you know, evolution of devices happens. I think we're seeing the evolution of the network as well. So if I go back to that cable example, you know, back in 2010, you might go to a cable company for your access and your voice and your messaging and your calendar. Now, I think what we're seeing at Verizon is a similar approach, but now it's all wireless. So it's a 5G wireless WAN into your office. It's a 5G anywhere mobile connection. And those same unified communications apps all work, but now they're in kind of a mobile first kind of a sense. And I think that's been another unlock for the industry as well. What when when people ask about, you know, or when you talk about, you know, unified communications, like what are the core technologies that you're thinking of? Or what do people ask about? Because I, I like I think of instant messaging. I think of, you know, video conferencing, of using, you know, uh, live meeting of Teams, of Zoom, of, of those kinds of uh, capabilities. Um, and I'm not even thinking of the telephony. I'm like taking that for granted because... I've got a phone. I can I can double click on somebody's profile and it just dial right within an app. Like, what are kind of those core things when you think of unified communications? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I think first I'll say I think the core fundamental ingredients still remain the same, right? It's 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 voice and phone as your anchor, and then it's meetings, whatever that might be. It's messaging, and then it's kind of customer care. Those are kind of the four. You know, those are kind of the anchors of everything. But I do think the modality and type of all those changes a lot, you know. Uh, I think one of the interesting things about as the world kind of moved to a mobile experience, it did do a few things. One, it kind of like broke that hard bundle. I think back in the day, everybody, Avaya, Cisco, Microsoft, were all trying to get you to be 100% in your experience. You're going to use their thing for everything. And I think with the mobile experience and kind of the evolution of app stores, you've seen this explosion of like a heterogeneous experience. Like people are totally happy to use one thing one minute, one thing the next minute. You're not getting everything from one vendor. And I think that's something we, we've we kind of embraced as well. You know, people are just going to gravitate to different tools at different times, you know. Uh, overseas, you see people using WhatsApp a lot for commerce now, mm-hmm. you know. So so I think the the core things of voice, meetings, messaging, CRM still the same, but like the experiences kind of differ a a lot. I think what I would then add to that is you're starting to see some great innovation now in kind of three areas, I think. One is of security, right? And that's just doesn't mean application security, but like voice security and biometrics and authenticating a person is really who they are, especially in the world of AI. Related to security is compliance especially with our larger unified communications customers. Compliance is so important. You know, these banks can get fined tens of millions of dollars by the SEC if they're not responsible with our communications. And, and then I think the third is kind of verticals. You know, for a long time, people would make these very horizontal UC plays, but there's great things you can do if you focus on dentists or construction or mining or realtors. And, and, and I think there's a real ability to kind of pivot the experience uh, and solution to verticals as well. So those are kind of the big trends I'm seeing. Yeah, it's it, it, a couple of thoughts there. Uh, and I often talk about um, when Satya Nadella became CEO of Microsoft uh, at his first, I think it was his first official keynote. It was at the partner conference, which is in July of that, that year when he became president where he talked about uh, like the goal of Microsoft to build the best software out there. He says, and then he went, he pivoted in a direction that caught a lot of people by surprise. He, he said, 
again, paraphrasing, but uh, is that, you know, we're, where we don't have the best solution or where we don't have any solution, we need to remember the customer, what they're trying to accomplish. And basically went on to say, he said, look at there, you know, there's the customer, what they're trying to do, end it from beginning to end. We may do pieces within that. We need to make sure that they have the best experience. We don't just say, well, we just do that part and the rest of it, good luck. Like, no, unhappy customer for all of us is an unhappy customer. And so we have to think about that continuity across the various solutions. And so he then talked about partnering and integration of, of that experience. That's been, especially over the last few years, this focus of companies, of software companies at least, on the employee experience, on the customer experience, uh, that, that, you know, that, that's whole space of, you know, experience management and being all of us should be responsible for no matter which technologies, which players are in place, what that looks like for the end customer. I, I think that's exactly right. And, and I remember reading that chapter of Satya's book and, and you're right. It was such a, a, a big culture change. It was such an announcement to the industry and, and it was important, right? I, I think as we're all kind of returning to the office more, it's becoming more evident as people kind of go back to physical devices sometimes. And what I mean by that is this, if I'm on a tablet or a mobile or even a laptop, it's easy to use different things, different tools as the case may be. But if you go into a big, large enterprise often, they usually have devices and equipment and room systems from a single vendor on the desk, whether it's Cisco or Neat or you know HP or whoever it might be. And back in the day, those devices would really only work with one thing. If you had a Cisco device, you know, console in your room, it was connected to the Cisco board and that was that. And I do think credit to Cisco, just like Microsoft, they've really kind of opened up. You know, if you're on that Cisco device, it's going to work with Microsoft. It's going to work with Zoom. It's going to work with everything. And, and I think that's, like you said, the customers are demanding that. And, and I think it's nice to see these walled gardens break down. Yeah. And, yeah. And that is happening in a lot of spaces, a lot of areas, um, like yeah, there's like the the open data initiative, uh, sharing of information where you have Microsoft playing nice with Oracle and SAP and Adobe and all these other players, um, which is again just a it's a big especially if you'd say like I, I met Bomber a couple times. Uh, he was an early morning uh, gym, the pro club for folks that are aware of the club there in town, and he would play ba basketball when he was in town. He'd play a couple times a week and. Uh, I was an early uh, pro club gym uh, 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 participant uh, and uh, would go and watch them a lot and very vocal. People would ask him questions. It's a bit awkward standing around the locker room. People are changing his <laughs> stuff and he's answering business questions. <laughs> like, but he, he did it. He was, he was pretty open, not a shy man, uh, yeah, by the way, <laughs> but I that's a different imagine. discussion. But uh, yeah, it, but it is. It, it, it's interesting to see how much the cultural shift is. And uh, I mean, I, again, I, a big part of that I put on Satya, but I also just think that the industry is evolving and changing from that. Um, like the sales models that worked uh, 10, 15 years ago, don't work the same way or at all. Uh, it's gotten very relationship management. And again, that experience management. I think that's exactly right. The experience management is different. The sales model is different. I mean, even the concept of a device is different. You know, back in the day, unified communications would be like, hey, who's got the best desk phone? And then it kind of trolls through the sale. You know, we've worked with like, you know, big, big frontline manufacturers, whether it's retail or a factory or whatnot. And they're all using kind of ruggedized mobile devices, right? That is the, that is the end point. And when you kind of reimagine you know, it kind of, you know, 20X grows what your unified communications market is. Unified communications really used to be just for the knowledge worker who sat in an office all day. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not that anymore. It's really for anybody. And and that's exciting, but you do have to have that real breadth and diversity of experiences or, or you're not going to be able to win the market. How did Verizon initially approach the unified communications market? Like, uh, What were the key factors driving its strategy? I think if I were to brag a little bit, I think it's I'm proud of the fact that in general, we've been kind of ahead of these curves and pivots and bends in the market. I think, full, you know, full disclosure, if you go back, you know, 15 years or so, 
we we kind of were looking a lot like everybody else and that it was very large enterprise focused like you said kind of expensive and i think the advantage verizon has because it's you know really a independent provider is we spent a lot of time on on heterogeneous solutions if a customer wanted to use cisco here and microsoft here we could do that if you wanted to be in europe and the americas and asia we could do that because we had a worldwide global backbone so i think we, we always had a little bit of a market advantage because we weren't vendor specific, right? We were vendor agnostic, partner agnostic, you know, technology agnostic. I think where I, I've, I'm proud of the fact that we've led, it's been in getting in front of these transitions. I think the first one was mobile, right? I think we're the first to do a integrated UC is built right into the wireless network. We did that before everybody else. Mm -hmm. I think uh, after that, we've done devices that are kind of just built into the network. We have desk phones that like one of the largest distributed retail companies in the United States is using, they still have desk phones, but rather than plug them into a LAN or a firewall, they just connect over the, the macro cellular network, just like, you know, just like an Android phone, right? Mm -hmm. We did that. And now I think we've kind of led in terms of integration with the, the, the new move to Microsoft Teams. And I think we've led into putting UC into kind of very small business and bringing that democratization down, down to the smaller customer. These are all the places we've used to play, basically going from large enterprise wireline to be everywhere and mobile first. Is there, maybe you know this off the top of your head, like what percentage of the enterprises are in cloud-based uh, unified comms versus those older systems? I tell you, it's it's shocking how many old premises legacy solutions are still out there. So, so you know, I I think probably we're at like let's say two thirds of of cloud based systems, and one third is still premises based. But even the cloud based is kind of a lot of that is on like Rel One Cloud. That's kind of making the move to the next version. You know, I do think like the, the market has been kind of in the CPaaS communications platform as a service API market for a while. And that's been a little bit niche, a little bit focused on more like two-factor authentications, SMS type of applications. We're seeing people use our platform for a lot of CPaaS and telco API things as well. And I only say that to say it's a little bit misleading to say cloud because a lot of them are on, you know, rel one of cloud and moving to rel two or the next or mobile cloud or right. consumption cloud or what have you. Right. Well, that, that's always the discussion from, uh, you know, information management systems as well. I mean, there's dedicated cloud. Is it really cloud? It's like, it's, it's you're hosting on somebody's servers, but is it really truly what the cloud is? But no, but I, I think something that has changed where I was kind of getting to is, is that, you know, the transformation of, of this space, because net new businesses, they're not going and putting infrastructure in place. I mean, if you look at even like the subcontinent, if you look at Africa, they're leading in areas around app development on, on I mean, you know, the currency exchanges of, of uh, you know, the, the various, the apps and tools that they use because there aren't lines in the ground. There's towers that instantly give them access to everything. I think that's exactly right. And there's it's so empowering uh, and inspiring to see some of that innovation, right? I do think in the US, one of the next big innovations we'll see is in payments because the payment doesn't have to be micropayments. It could be about running your business in a different way as well. I, I do think if I look back to kind of the generation one of unified communications, it really was a lot of people trying to replicate the old PBX in a cloud SaaS model. Mm -hmm. And I remember talking to my old boss about this because people would ask us like, hey, can you replicate an old legacy pro feature like call park on an IP based cloud system? And we would sit and look at ourselves and go like, well, why would anybody right. actually want that? It's like right. when you move houses, you don't, right. you don't take everything from the old house with you. You kind of start again. And, and I do think like it really is the art of the product management and product marketing side to say, what is it that people really value and really value next? To your point about new businesses, I'm always excited to see the rate of new businesses and particularly small business applications in the U.S. There's so much new things starting. And a lot of these 
founders, many of them are in their 20s, are just going to start in a new way. You know, you're not going to buy fiber or DSL. You're going to buy a, a mobile link. You're going to be all mobile. There's like new ways of thinking about the world. And, and I think that that's good. That's a challenge to the unified communications providers to say, how are you going to serve this next generation of customers? Well, that's the other thing too, where a lot of that innovation comes because they're not looking to those old features. Like they're not going to know to ask for those old features, a lot of those capabilities, but what drives so much of it is then they are asking to say, well, about, you know, cross-platform integrations. They're asking about integrations with their other collaboration technology. They want to do more. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, it goes back to, I mean, I started my career as a business analyst and a tech writer. And one of the things that we always, this dilemma of like, do you go right into a prospect client and do you ask them, well, what are your requirements or do you show them some of the new technology? The problem is that people will give you their requirements through their lens of understanding today. If you show them all what's possible, then the, the, the downside is they won't ask for enough because they won't understand what's possible versus they'll see all this cool stuff and then ask for things that aren't relevant. And if there's the happy place in the middle of, of all of that, you know, it is, but it's, I mean, that's, that's where it, that innovation, you know, comes from is people that are asking, you know, for things that not, maybe not fully understanding the history, but asking for things that sometimes landing on like novel approaches or, or methods for how they think that they need to work. I, I think that's exactly right. But what I'd say is that as much as the technology changes, as much as the macroeconomic environment changes, the demographics change, you know, one thing I think is consistent, which is like, no matter what kind of business you go to, they, they, they want to run a successful business. And there's a saying I used to say a lot, which was we help people focus on their core business, not their chore business, right? So all these companies, they want to be the best caterer, the best law firm, the best Bitcoin broker, whatever it is. They, they, they want their competitive advantage to be their business, not that, oh, they run their UC better than the other company down the street runs their UC. And that's where I think you mentioned the partners before. I think the partners, the indirect channel, the, the providers like Verizon, our obligation is to support these customers so they can do what they do best and we right. can kind of take all of this off their off their plate. And a lot of that, like you said, it's, it's kind of balancing that line of requirements versus versus outcomes. That that is what you just described. I mean, that that's true across again information systems. Uh, you know, the majority of my career, we we spent the first half uh, of my career, first fifteen to eighteen years, we were worried about keeping the servers up and running, and so so much of the IT pro role was keeping servers up and running, and actually using those servers for the business purposes was. I don't want to say secondary, but almost secondary just to keeping that thing up and running. Now, you know, we're, we're at a maturity of a lot of these technologies where we, that we can rely on them that like the consistency of the delivery of the solutions, I mean, it's really high. Uh, and so that does exactly what you said. We could focus instead. So we don't have all these telephony experts, all these UC experts that we have to have in house to fix things that instead we can have experts on the services and focus on, well, what are we as a company trying to do? We're creating a product. We can create X more because we're able to collaborate in real time and kind of everything else. And that's exactly right. And, and, and that, when that magic happens, that's, that's when it's so enjoyable to see, because I know, you know, millions of person hours goes into work underneath to make it reliable. Like you said, to make sure you're hitting that carrier. Right. Rate I, don't, I don't want to minimize the actual, the work but, the, all that, yeah, but, yeah. I'm just saying, but I'm saying that Verizon's doing that. So we don't have to, I mean, exactly. You know, Microsoft is doing that with office 365 with Microsoft. So we don't have to do that on our own. Exactly. And then you see that innovation come from the market and that's, that's kind of inspiring. Right. I, I've told the story before. I think we've talked about it. Like, one of the great things about my job is I get to see our customers and they go all the way from the largest enterprises and the largest federal governments. But my favorite customer, we have a one line, 89 year old grandmother in Montana who started her own Etsy business at the age of 89. And, and that, that inspires me that she was able to just take the tools we have and start her dream business. 
you know, what a great story that is. And it just, just goes to show like kind of how much we've opened up innovation to everybody. Yeah. Well, something too, I was thinking about how, like, I, I think a common story uh, about the pandemic, looking back, um, I always kind of, you know, half joke, like, like nobody talks about the positive sides of COVID of the pandemic. Um, uh, but the reality is it, it really did expedite so many organizations, their strategies, their, uh, you know, uh, their UC strategies. Did you also see, did Verizon experience, you know, any uh, evolution of the technology? Like, did you, did you shift in different directions, maybe unexpectedly because of what we collectively experienced? I, I, we sure did. And, and I'll point out two things. One kind of the under the surface to the point of investment and kind of one above the surface that the customer saw. The I, I remember it like it was yesterday, that first week in March when everything, March 2020, when everything really shut down. Mm -hmm. uh, it, you know, we spent a lot of time at Verizon kind of analyzing the network, analyzing traffic and things like that. And for us, Mother's Day in the U.S. is the biggest day of the year in terms of calls and traffic. Everybody calls. For that one week in March, it was like every day was more than Mother's Day and every day got bigger than the day before. Because what happens is all these companies that were in a single locations, you know, you consolidate on trunks, consolidate network, and it was just massively distributed. Yeah. And the amount of just network infrastructure that we had to just build out in seven days was was just shocking. It was a lot of sleepless nights, and, and and we got through it. Right, we were able to stay ahead of the traffic surge, but but I think what's happened is you know as you saw that kind of supernova out of COVID, it did a lot of businesses stayed permanent. A lot of people worked at home. A lot of new business formed. So we were kind of being able to build that infrastructure to support this big growth in the market. I think the other kind of big trend it pushed towards was was kind of mobile devices and kind of that mobile first approach. You know, people didn't bring their IP desk phone home. They used their mobile. But also it started a whole new, almost a whole new generation of customers too. You know, these big uh, city governments and state governments would bring in like tablets from us or jet packs or devices for students to go home. And people just kind of got used to running on kind of a mobile first experience. So I think that was, you know, another kind of, uh, those are the two things I'd point to, the infrastructure build and then that kind of shift to mobile first. It, yeah, I always, it, it just reminds me of like every conference you've ever been to, how the Wi-Fi sucks on day one, you know, it's like no matter how much, we know we're going to have 20,000 people here. Uh, and and yet it just they seem always like cut off guard by the demand that's on on the network on that first day and it levels out and they adjust up and from that and unified comms providers experience that like yeah. around the world everybody all at once yeah that was that that's a big scalability it, it was it was great it was hard to go through that first week i'll tell you that but it has been great to see it like just you know live on kind of right and again not just the uc part right as we've grown our fixed wireless access business we've got you know millions of customers on that so we're seeing people not just running their voice or you know calls or s messaging on our network they're, they're running their wan and lan too it's it, it's kind of a neat kind of a you, can, you kind of feel like the technology is like kind of making that shift forward can you also discuss what you see as like current impacts or what you see as impacts around some of the, 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 the technologies that are coming forward? I mean, there's, I mean, IOT has been around for a while, but we're seeing more and more adoption. There's a lot of, I'm not so much in a VR fan as an AR and augmented reality. Some of the features, the capabilities that are going to come through that. And then of course, the AI. I mean, so how, you know, how does Verizon look at those and, and, and how are you preparing for those? Yeah. So job one, and it's a kind of a good kind of a carry on of kind of that network uh, undercurrent, you know, the amount of data you're going to need to deliver, you know, AI payloads or AR payloads or VR payloads, you, know, you got to be ready for that as well. So job for one for us is just invest in the network and we continue to invest in the network. The amount of capital and build out we put into that, it's pretty, pretty impressive. Um, and, you know, so just like we had to stay in front of the UC growth under COVID, we're staying in front of the growth on that side as well. Mm -hmm. I think the other part of it that I think is going to be interesting, though, is, you know, what what are the use cases that come out 
and then how does that kind of drive the usage as well? Like you, I'm I'm a little skeptical on VR and the B2B or business side. I think it might have a little more play in the consumer side. Education not, probably is yeah. it's probably the strongest, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. But but I tell you, AR, uh super excited about that also. Mm-hmm. And I mentioned before we're we're seeing more frontline deployments with like ruggedized endpoints, like think about like a a, a manufacturing plant or a food mm-hmm. processing plant or things like that. You know, those same types of customers are big uses of private networks, right? You know, they can just run a private 5G network. They can run IoT on that private network as well and run AR type of things. So again, it's it's almost like I think of it as unified communications, but it's not a knowledge worker. It's just a different kind of use case. And I think seeing IoT and AR, a uh, big, big, well, we're seeing those now. I, I'm not even sure I'd look at those as future. I think on the AI side, I do wonder if sometimes, you know, we're in a little bit of that maximum hype and we'll see where it comes back on. Yeah, there's uh, some of that will argue that like, oh, no, no, we're getting into the adoption. Like, no, no, I think the hype cycle is still in full swing. <laughs> I, I think here's where I think it might be interesting in the UC space, and it's a little early, but like I, I think some of the most clever, creative, silly, fun things with AI and Gen AI specifically are, are really on kind of like content creation right now, right? I want to make art, I want to make poster, I want to make marketing collateral, things like that. Uh, like one of the things where we think the market's going to go to and we're in some early prototypes is what happens when Gen AI is like, in your voice path or media path or meeting path, right? So today, I think, you know, we've seen Microsoft do some cool things with Copilot. You can do a meeting and then you get kind of your action items, you know, and your your summaries and things like that. That's super interesting because they're tapping into that media path to give you intelligence. You think about, well, where else could you take that, right? You could take it for real-time language translation. You could take it for fraud detection. Uh, you could take it for emergency services and first responders and security. Uh, and, and I do think once we kind of tap into that voice path with Gen AI, then you might see some interesting use cases come out of there as well. Yeah, I think we're, uh, you yeah, know, next, next four to five years, uh, it, it's going to mature very quickly, but I think you're, you're exactly right. In fact, there's a, there, it was just out in the news, like the new, uh, uh, you probably saw it in the news, the, the new Argentine president and they like, I don't know what AI platform it was, but it was doing near real time yeah. voice and it actually modified the video as well. Um, yeah. and so his mouth looked like he was speaking English. I mean, it's just amazing. I want that in, I, in, in team meetings, right? A- anybody, nice. any language jump in. And, uh, yeah, I know that Microsoft is working on it. You know what it is, Alex, it's, we're getting so close to the Star Trek Universal Translator, have a little wow. thing on our collar. It, it it it's connected to our our mobile phones, so that's fine. You have to have it within you know three feet of your person, but with that yeah. little communicator and be able to talk and hear back in your native language. I think it's going to be great, and I think you know right now you know that Argentinian example. I think a lot of it they kind of take the media path, they do a voice to text transcription, and then they use the text to feed it back in, and that's good. But it's an extra hop once you can kind of tap into the media directly without the voice to text. Then it gets even more interesting. Obviously, it also brings some interesting ethics, fraud, fraud prevention. You're going to see an arms race there as well. You know, one of the products we have today on our big enterprise call center side is fraud detection. If someone calls in and tries to spoof a voice, we have ways of kind of detecting that, hey, this is, you know, highest score risk of fraud. You know, it's going to be an arms race in terms of, you know, yeah. seeing where things go in that as well. I think we'll all have to be diligent. Well, I think you just named like one of the, uh, I'd say one of the most um, important future trend spaces where we need to focus. And there's a, a it, there's a reason why there's so many security focused startups that are popping up, looking at different aspects of this. What else do you see? Like, what, what do you see? Or what are your predictions of like the, the areas where we might see the most change? Well, I, I, I do wonder, I think it's a couple of things. One, I think you're going to see pretty big changes if, in the security space when we kind of broaden the aperture to five or 10 years, right? When you look at what the quantum computing applications are for security, it's going to be kind of mind blowing. 
So, so uh, we are kind of pretty excited about what we're going to see happening in the, the, the security side as well. Um, I do think the we expect hardware costs to come down. You kind of mentioned the Star Trek University translator. You know, you've seen kind of these AI type pins that can kind of, you know, project onto your hand, things like that. I, I think that one maybe didn't quite have product market fit, but I do think we're going to see more things like that as well. You know, I can go to a Whole Foods and use like a palm checkout kind of stuff. I think a reliance on devices is going to go away and a kind of little more about wearables and the person and that way i can just kind of walk into a room and use any device i think that's an area where there's room for um, innovation as well so maybe we're not all tied to our phones but we're tied to like a community of devices out there as well i, I think that's another area that you know what's that bill gates thing you 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 overestimate what's going to happen in two years but underestimate what's going to happen in 10 i think when you look at that two to ten frame i think I think you're going to see some things in those spaces. That's why I always admired Microsoft. Every few years, they do their, uh, you know, the future office. Like they do a video that I think is produced by their R and D team, which I, I remember seeing it when I joined in 2006. Uh, it was a building uh, um, right near mine. You could look at Microsoft had like a little museum and stuff in it. I think it's in there. Um, it, it, in there i think they have the, the an actual museum in building 92 now it might be part of that but anyway um i remember watching that and i mean one it was like a person wakes up in the morning and they they grab this piece of glass and there's not you know and then they touch it and all of a sudden this data comes and as they walk into the bathroom they flick it to the wall and all this kind of stuff anyway, it was showing all these things and i thought two things one invest in Windex because in the future it's glass everywhere, <laughs> fingerprints everywhere. So, you know, everybody's going to need their Windex. Um, but um, two was just, you know, working there. And then over the last 15 years, how much of what I saw in that video back in 2006 has actually come about that they've, they've actually done. And so it's still you know, like, one of the, it's like going back and looking at um, the, uh, uh, videos of the fifties where they're predicting the future yeah. and flying cars and all that. And there's a lot of things that are ridiculous and the design aesthetic changed, you know, all those kinds of things, but how much we've actually done that they kind of predicted called, called back. And so it, it, it is, it, that's why I like, I love science fiction because especially when it's hard sci-fi that is based on actual technology uh, so much more real, you can actually see, you know, the thinking, the understanding of 1980s, uh, written a book written in 1980s about sci-fi, how much actually is rooted in actual technology and, and we see in the modern day. You know, I'll, I'll, so I agree with all that. And I'll also give my friends at Microsoft another shout out too. They've done some great publications over the last year or so about kind of almost the, the, the mental and physical and brain aspects of like the ways of working now. And I think you've probably seen it, right? They, they've literally kind of measured brain waves of what happens if you've got back-to-back -back meetings for four hours versus if you space things out. And it's, it's, it's pretty shocking research when you get into it. And, and I'll give you another example from my personal life. I like to listen to podcasts. I like to go listen to them when I go for a walk on the weekend. And, and and I've often I've always listened to them at like 1.2 speed, mm -hmm. and I think what happens when you listen to podcasts at high speed for a while, it can kind of like you know mess with your brain a little yeah. bit. Like why why are you talking so slow, Alex? <laughs> you know, <laughs> right? I know. And I do think as we see all these innovation things of the technology, I'd just like to give a shout out to to Microsoft about the research they're doing. Yeah. But I think we're going to have to continue to think about the human aspect of this and and how people intersect with this technology i always recommend people if you've not found the microsoft blog the work lab site um is it work lab io or worklab.com or anything if you just go look for the work lab one word work lab blog you'll find that but it's exactly what you talk about so they go into the employee experience you know realm it's what that site was started, they're talking about the data, the research that went into the decisions they make around products and features. So you're getting 
the story, the historical view of why, and they share the data and they share various, you know, surveys and reports they make public through that, that site that help drive their innovation. And so it's fascinating as that's always as, as a product person, it's something that's frustrating too. And when you're customer facing, especially where you've written in, you're like, look, I've got these issues or these problems with the way that the user experiences that the UI needs to change and, and this, and here's why. And, and it just seems like, why are you wasting time on this feature that can't be serving many needs and you're taking so long on this other item that's in the, the backlog and they go through and they explain like mm -hmm. the reasoning behind a lot of those different things. And you now, and, and so it's, it's, uh, it's one of those things where, uh, uh, you have to be a bit more empathetic when you're providing feedback, feedback, I'll put in air quotes here, um, to Microsoft um, of why you want to see something and, and understand that they have some very smart people that are looking at all those same things. And while keeping in mind backwards compatibility, integration, future innovations that we're not privy to, like all those different things. Um, and limited resources. They don't just have tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of engineers to jump and work on any one project. There's only so many people that you can have working on something developing, but again, that's true. Just, no matter how big my, you are, you my soapbox, reason. be empathetic <laughs> to that, provide constructive feedback back to, to your vendors. Yeah. But uh, I, I do want to ask you um, a couple more questions. Um, one, um, Again, going back and looking at historical, like what stands out to you as some of the most significant innovations that you've seen uh, for Verizon's unified communication solutions to date? I'm going to lean into the mobility because I think one is something we're pretty proud of. And I think it's something that really kind of moved the industry forward. So, so I'll, I'll, I'll pick three. I'll, I'll say one is back around 2016 on more of the small and medium business side. We launched one talk. OneTalk is basically a cloud unified communication solution, but it's built into the wireless network. So it just, it just, you just grab your Android or iPhone or a desk phone if you want it, and it just works. You don't have to go to WebEx or this or that or the other thing. It just worked. It was just like, hey, I'm starting a business with 10 people. I'm just going to say, here's 10 iPhones and we're off to the races. I, I think making it mobile first, we were early, but I think we we're leaders and it changed the market. So that's one. I think more recently, I'll talk about that uh, macro cellular desk phone we did, kind of the enterprise flavor of our one talk family, where, you know, look, a lot of businesses still want desk phones. Maybe you're a laundromat, maybe you're a hardware store, or a retail store, or maybe you're like a big um, rental car company. We have one, which has got like 30,000 of these in airports and train stations and kiosks around the world they were able to just get rid of all of their legacy old phone systems and put these cellular based desk phones on each desk. So you just, all you do is just plug it in to power and it works just like a cell phone. You just turn it right. on and it downloads. Yeah. That's changed the deployment and cost factors for these businesses, like literally 20 X, 20 X cheaper, 20 X faster. So that's been a huge win. And then the third one, I'll, I'll lean into what we've done with mobile and the Microsoft Teams family, right? You know, Microsoft will call it Teams Phone Mobile. I, I think this is taking all the power, um, productivity, consolidation of Teams, and then giving it kind of that smartphone front end to it. So like, you know, I was you know, with one of my buddies at Microsoft uh, at a customer recently, and he goes, watch this. And he goes, hey, call my work number, right? He just, just calls the work number. We're going to talk for a bit. He goes, now watch this. And it's all turned into that co-pilot AI meeting summary because the cell phone experience now kind of inherits all of the capabilities of Teams and co-pilot and whatnot. So look, Teams is great, but like you're not always going to use it on your laptop when you're at the office. You want it on, you know, right in your native dialer experience. So, so I'm going to say I'm most proud of how we've moved the ball forward on the mobile side, because at the end of the day, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to you know, care for all our networks. But I think the more we're seeing B2B customers on our mobile network, I think that's just been our, our differentiator. Well, that's uh, that's kind of a segue. You kind of answered part of it. I was going to my last question was talk about some of your partnerships because you've signed some pretty significant partnerships and your teams. And you also work with Zoom. You work with a number of players that are out there. 
how much do those collaborations, uh, you know, shape uh, Verizon's UC offerings? Is that do you? Uh, uh, so you you just had a great example. I don't know how much that changed what your product teams were looking at and thinking about based on that integration, but that seems like uh, that would generate a lot of ideas of, oh, hey, here's yeah. more that we could do deeper into the it, co-pilot path. Just like we mentioned with Satya's book way, way back, we're, we're very partner oriented as well. For, for us and from the way I look at it, it is kind of segment based. I think the more you go into small and medium businesses, the more our customers are really just looking for Verizon home built products. Mm. You know, they're going to go into a Verizon retail store or they're going to move and start a new business and they're going to want our fixed wireless access WAN and then the service with it. So in that area, candidly, we build it more ourselves and we partner less. It's things like one talk, like our one talk cellular desk phone, things like that. But once you go up market into the large enterprises, uh, into the state governments, the federal governments, they were really partner oriented because candidly, these partner, these customers are often looking to either go with the brand of our partners, like the Microsoft Teams, or they already have Microsoft Teams or WebEx or Amazon Connect, and they're looking to integrate what they already have with our networks. So that's kind of how we look at it. Down market, it's more the Verizon brand. Up market is where we partner. Well, Alex, I really appreciate you taking the time to sit and walk through, go down memory lane into UC, that world. But uh, uh, yeah, it's a, I, I'm, I'm excited to see what further transformation is going to happen in this space with the way technology is going. And I, I'm, I'm preparing to be surprised by some of what might come out of these, uh, the integrations, just because I think it's, the rate of change is speeding up and we're going to see a lot more. It's, it's, uh, was just talking earlier today about the, the fact that with uh, co-pilot uh, expansion so that there's no um, gate of 300 users per, you know, per uh, environment to be able to leverage the co-pilot capabilities and now it's open to anybody to go and use. And they came up with personal pricing as well as the enterprise pricing, like that side of it. A month and a half after it was all released, you know, it, it happened very quickly. Uh, and, and so I think you're going to see new SKUs, new features, new capabilities, especially through the partnerships. It's going to happen a lot faster as we yeah. move forward. It's going to continue to speed up. That's, we don't know what's going to happen, but we know that's true. You're right. It's, yeah. uh, it's never going to be as slow as it was yesterday. We're right. going to keep speeding up, right? That's right? Next time we do one of these, we'll use the AI and it'll darken my hair and make me look young again. <laughs> <laughs> we can wash that gray right out of our hair. That's right. Yeah. Well, Alex, really appreciate your time. Thanks so much, Christine. You've been listening to the Collab Talk podcast. New episodes are published weekly, and you can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, and most other podcast platforms. Thanks for listening.